text for which we are ahead is John 9, 24, 25. Then again called they the man that was blind. And Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath day. Oh, yeah, that really set the Pharisees on. So they had caught it, that was blind, and said unto him, Give God praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Talk about Jesus. And he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. So when you look at chapter 9, and you've got to understand, let, let's talk a little bit about the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. That word means viewed together. Matthew presents him as the king of the Jews. Luke presents him as the godly man. Mark presents him as the divine servant. John represents him and presents him as the son of God, the divine son of God. And there are these people, Josh, that go around every summer knocking on your door, and they tell you that only 144,000 people are going to go to heaven. You just take them to the book of John, Josh. Then you ask them, and they're always part of that 144,000. And you ask them, well, why are you out here knocking on doors lessening your chances? But anyway, <laughs> uh, John presents him as the son of God. But in the first chapters, one through eight, there's a there's a confrontation building, and it still continues over into chapter 9. In fact, it's chapter 8 and 9 that are really viewed together. But Jesus had a confrontation, buddy. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus was kind and gentle to those that wanted to be saved. But he didn't have anything for self-righteous bigots. Right, right. Now, that's who he's having a confrontation I'll tell you what, people always want to picture him as the Lamb of God, and he is. It's all, it is. But if you want to read a scathing sermon, read Matthew chapter 23. If I'd have been a Pharisee, when he preached that, I'd have crawled a hole, I dug me a hole and crawled into a den. And same thing here. I mean, you talk about a confrontation with the self-righteous bigots. This is what he said. Ye of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you would do. You were, he was a murderer from the beginning. And about not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And what he's really saying to those self-righteous bigots is, you're from the regions of down there. So he, when you get to chapter 9, you're going to see one of the seven I am statements always showing a relationship with Christ and the church, but in John chapter 6, after the discourse on the bread of life, he says, I'm the bread of life. In John chapter 10, he says, I'm the door to the sheepfold. In chapter 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. In chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. John uh, 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then in just chapter, I am the bread of life. I'm, I'm sorry, I am, in chapter 9, I am the light of the world. So those are the I am statements. It's interesting, by the way, when you look over the book of John, and they came to arrest Jesus, and they said, who's Jesus? And you'll see it says, I am he. But I want you to notice something in the King James Bible. That's why I like the King James Bible. Whenever it adds a word to the original Greek, it puts it in italicis. And so he says, I am he, and that's a thousandized print. What he really said, Nathan, was, who's Jesus? I am. He's the same I am that was in the burning bush when he spoke to Moses. And so anyway, uh, he saw him the light of the world. Now, I have told him I'm eating this, Josh. Whole thing, okay? Remember what I told you. A text without a context is a proof text for a proof text. Okay? That makes sense to you after a while. But anyway, I'm going to give you the context. I'm going to give you the setting of this miracle. And uh, so this miracle was performed on the Sabbath day. It occurred at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. And you've got to understand the Jewish custom. I mean, the temple was a big, tall place. You know, they built these huge torches, as tall as the temple, and they would light them. And then they would dance 
all night under the light of those torches till the early morning hours when it was just ashes. The elder men would do that. So John is careful to set the stage for this miracle. John is careful to show the approaching drama between light and darkness. When John, uh, 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 so, uh, when John discusses a, a miracle, uh, he, he's wanting you to see a deeper truth, a deep truth. So uh, you need to understand something. The world out there, they don't know they're lost. They are in darkness. J. Bernard McGee, one of really my favorite, one of my favorite writers. I have favorite writers. Yes, I read commentaries, and I'm not ashamed to say I did. <laughs> but there are bad commentaries. Just get you a good foundational understanding of the Bible first, and then read the commentaries. But J. Bernard McGee, really solid preacher, told of a story about a cave in and a mine in West Virginia. And he died in 1988, so it's been a while. And uh, so the rescuers came in, and finally broke through, and the lights were all lit up, and this one young man said, well, why don't they turn on the lights? When the darkness there, he, he didn't know he was blind. That's when they recognized it. He's been blinded by the explosion. That's the way the world is. They don't know they're spiritually blind. Helen Keller, surely you've heard of her, the little blind and deaf girl that Ann Sullivan, the miracle worker, performed, taught her how to read Braille. She said, gradually, I got used to the darkness and silence and forgot that it was ever, it had been different until she, my teacher, set me free. Well, that's the way it is for a person to be saved. They need to come to understand that they're lost and that it's Jesus who will set them free from their spiritual darkness. Another writer of mine, a favorite writer of mine, you've never heard of it probably, Dr. R. Kent Hughes, president of Wheaton College, a religious college, pastor of a church. Big church, he had several ophthalmologists, Joe, or let's put it in Mike Richardson terms, <laughs> eye doctors, okay? And so uh, he, he asked them, he was talking about this miracle, this amazing miracle. Uh, we're not talking about just some average, ordinary miracle. <laughs> he asked them, he said, have any of you ever seen a man or a person who was born blind that got their sight? He said, to a man, every one of them said, absolutely not. Yes, they did. See, babies that were born with cataracts and had the cataracts removed that could see. But never anyone that was born blind ever got their sight. So this, I want you to know this is a very special, very special miracle that we're looking at. And so here's the apostles coming in. <laughs> Chapter 9, verse 2. Who said that this man should be like this? Well, you've got to understand they had different views about people's conditions. One was reincarnation. And they said the reason he, they would say the reason why this man is blind now is because he did something bad in his past life. And now he's getting this, they love this word, Joe. They're, he's getting his karma. Mm -hmm. Karma. Okay. Then there's heredity. People today talk about that all the time. I hear it all the time by people who claim to be Christians who believe this, and they talk about a generational curse. Right. And they go over to uh, uh, Exodus 5, talking about what would be passed to the third and fourth generation. Well, you know, the effect of a sin can, the influence of a sin can go that far down. But I, I've got a verse that will show you that, no, God does not hold Joe Doe said guilty for a sin that Mike Richardson committed. I actually heard someone say, well, such and such died because this person over here sinned. 
God let this person die. No. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. In other words, if I'm wicked, God's going to hold me guilty for it. You know, it says, and every man shall give an account, right? Of his own life. What, what he did in the Bible, whether it be good or bad. No. God does not hold somebody else guilty for somebody else's sin. Of course, then they would say, well, it's the effect of Adam's sin. Well, there's got to be some truth to that. Mm -hmm. Finally, get a load of this one. You talk about people who hold strange beliefs. The Jews believe that a child could sin when they're in the womb. How do they get that one? Well, they suck it out of their thumb, you know. Okay. So, anyway, I would make you pull some of those amazing things out. Well, uh, I want you to notice how Jesus responds to that question. Who, who did sin that this man? Jesus ignored and did not even answer that question. He ignored, the, ignored their pointed and unprofitable debate. I've got some advice for you. Never debate with a lost religious person. Right. Isaiah 58, 4 says, Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness that your voice would be heard on high. They'd argue with God. There was a preacher on the radio, and I, Aaron, you know where I'm going. Oh, yeah. Here I go again. I mean, this man hated Baptist. And every Sunday he'd preach. Whenever he referred to the preacher, he'd go, Mr. Baptist preacher. Like that. And I thought, such a ton of love. <laughs> See, you're just beating your hand. You're beating, like they say, you're beating a dead horse, you know? After all, they're just, a, and this is what Jesus had to face. They're just a little smarter than you are, I think. You know? I mean, they've got it all figured out, okay? They're, you know, religious know it alls, okay? They're self satisfied religious people who think that they have attained. Now, the Apostle Paul said it this way in Philippians 3.12 about himself. Now, here's a man who wrote at least 13 books in the New Testament, I personally think 14. But he said this a man inspired by the Word of God, I have to write 14 books in the New Testament. That's my opinion. Okay. You don't agree with me, but if you want to be right, I agree with you. And uh, so, not as though, he says, I already attained, <laughs> either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may have apprehend that which. Also, I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He didn't count himself to attain. But these people, self-satisfied self religious people, they're hard to deal with. Yeah. I mean, I, I, don't just, I just don't like talking to them, John. I would just as soon try to nail jello to a tree than to talk to a self-righteous bigot who's got it all figured out. Yeah. And so this man is healed by they want him to testify. They want his testimony. Well, there's a trick to this, and it really wasn't real. What they're really wanting is a certain answer so they can deny the miracle of Jesus Christ. And so here they come, three or four of them, a little mini Sanhedrin. Now, Preacher George, I am sure. And Preacher Joe, and Preacher John, Preacher Samuel. Preach any while after a while, you're going to run into these little mini Sanhedrins. And they corner you and they, they've got questions for, you know. I know of a church where a preacher preached something and they didn't like it. Oh, well, we'll put him on the carpet. That's something that that's what I heard him say. We'll put him on the carpet. But he, we'll just withdraw fellowship from him. I said, No, I'm never your church. How can you do that? <laughs> I don't understand many Sanhedrin type people. And so you can see it by this ridiculous interrogation. 
three ridiculous interrogations. They call the blind man in. He says, all I, all I know is that once I was blind, but now I see. Then they called his parents in. And they were terrified that they were going to be excommunicated, kicked out of the temple and so on. So then they called him back in again. This time, he's a little bit sarcastic with them, Joe. They said, are you all going to become disciples too? You know. So anyway, uh, you, you, you see that all the time with self-righteous people. So they're guilty of a religious conniving. And they're every bit a match uh, for the Greek philosophers. So these people are smart. These people are intelligent in a wicked way. And so they're using a syllogism. Oh, there's that big word. Let me tell you something about big words. They have used these big words to impress you. And got these little bitty ideas behind them. Right. I was teaching over college over here at Gladwell, and then I taught down at, after I taught public school, then I taught down at Western University of Parkersburg, Ripley Branch. I had refused to drive to Parkersburg for one. I said, you don't pay me enough to drive that one. But anyway, uh, I used to teach them what a syllogism was. That's a simple idea. Don't, don't be impressed with that big word. A syllogism has a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And so they had a false syllogism. Here's their false syllogism. All people from God keep the Sabbath. See, he made clay put on a man's eye. By the way, that was against the law. <coughs> You couldn't do that. So, uh, their syllogism goes like this. All people from God keep the Sabbath. Jesus wrote the Sabbath, did not keep the Sabbath. Therefore, the conclusion is, he's not God. That's, what they, that's, the, that's the answer they want. Well, folks, you know, let me give you the correct syllogism. Only a man from God can open the eyes of a blind man. Blind man. Right. Only a God can open the eyes of a blind man. Blind man. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you my sermon title. Blind is a bad. That's, that's my sermon title. <laughs> and uh, so only a God can open the eyes of a blind man. Blind man. I can't say that. Blind man. Jesus opened the eyes of this man. Therefore, Jesus must be God. See, that's the correct syllogism. The problem with the Pharisees is, here's this, and I see it in our churches too. I was talking to this lady one time, a proud Baptist. She said, wait a minute. Aren't those the ones that fight among themselves all the time? I said, well, I guess that's true. <laughs> all right. Shouldn't be that way, should it? And so... Uh, the problem that they had was that they were focused on what they thought they saw. And they never examined their own hearts. Folks, we need to be examining our hearts. A great preacher by the name of Alexander White, spelled with a Y, but pronounced with an I. Young preacher came in, said, there's a preacher over here preaching, her. and he said, Dr. Lynn Wilson is not a Christian. And he goes, what? No one could say that he's not a Christian. Okay? Well, he says, he says you're not saved either. <laughs> Alexander White said, believe me. My friend, believe me. I need to examine my heart. See, he'd fight for everybody else, but when it came down to it, he wouldn't examine himself. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the Pharisees didn't do. See, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 2.14. Talk about the unsaved man. It says, in the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. A great English statesman one time said, uh, all it takes for evil to succeed is for good men to do nothing. Mm -hmm. He went and heard Dr. Witherspoon preach, he said, I don't understand the thing he says. John Hancock, you know, the guy who once wrote on the Declaration of Independence with his signature so high that King George could read it without his glasses. 
went and heard this same preacher, John Witherspoon, and he didn't understand the same about Christ is the door, faith is the key. Then he got home and opened the door and said, I understand, you know. An epiphany had, had occurred, a, a sudden understanding. He opened the door and he goes, I see, I see. And the family said, well, of course you see, you're, you're standing in the door. I mean, you know, a lot of people still in the dark. Okay. Christ is the door, faith is the key. So I want to get down to his testimony. I like it. All I know is once I was blind, but now I see. So simple, so precise. May I say this to you? The Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. And Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus. The most amazing conversion in Bible history. Wow. Who are talking the Lord? I'm Jesus. It's hard to pick against the pricks and so on. So, anyway. Uh, I want to tell you something. Richard Jordan, I don't know about you, but I did not have an Apostle Paul type of conversion. Mine was just plain, ordinary, if you want to use the word, dull. Nothing major happened. I believed. I confessed. On the Lord and Baptist. See, today there's a whole host of people out there saying that if you want you to experience salvation, you're going to have some kind of supernatural event that happens with you. You might, you, you're probably going to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit fell on me, Sister Sally, and I said, Yeah, but yeah, but do! <laughs> Listen, folks. That's what salvation is all about. No. Or I prayed this hole in the sky and I prayed and prayed and I softened God's heart. Let me tell you something. God's heart need never be softened that he will would, would save you. Right. God's heart is always ready to save you. I just like it so much. In his testimony, he you just, uh, you just tell what happened to you. Later on, in the book of Acts, when Paul's before all those kings and telling his testimony, he, he just says, this is what happened to me. Your testimony doesn't have to be fancy. Yeah. See, God's Word uses this chapter as a testimony. By the way, a testimony is an oral or written statement. And so this chapter is a testimony. And I think we're going to have an evangelistic message, and I hope there's somebody who might be here that might be lost, get saved. Yeah. God's Word, you, he, he uses the rest of this chapter to show how what comes to salvation. It's a testimony. It's a testimony of Jesus Christ. By the way, the New Testament is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 16 and 17 says, <clears throat> where a testament is, there must also necessity to be the death of a testator. That's Jesus. He had to die for you and me. For a testament of, uh, is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it has no strength at all where the testator lives. So, this chapter just pictures salvation. The man is born blind, folks. Every man who's ever been born into this world after the Garden of Eden been born separated from God, right. in a sinful state, spiritually blinded. We do not grasp or understand, I don't think we ever can, the immensity of, uh, and the effect of the fall of man. So every one of us were once spiritually blind. And I don't like it when self-righteous people say, God, God, he got such a prize when he got me. I don't like self-righteous, I like Jesus. 
I noticed now that Jesus, he didn't come to Jesus. Jesus came to him. Mm -hmm. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Amen. Jesus is coming to you today if you're here in the lost. Right. He's appearing to you in the person of the Holy Spirit to draw you. And no man can come unto the Father unless the Father draw him. Mm -hmm. He is instructed. I like this so well. Now the water dog theologists would pound on that going to the water. The water dog theology, that's my term for people who say you have to be baptized to be saved. <laughs> okay, and uh, so the water dog theologists would pound on that. This man was given instruction. You go by faith, you believe in the message that I tell you, and you go wash in the body, in the, in the pool of Siloam. Well, the word Siloam, Nathaniel, just happens to mean sent, S-E-N-D. So the picture is you go by faith, you take the message, and you go by faith to the one who was sent in this world to seek and save that which is lost. It's a picture of Christ. It's not water baptism. I've said it so many times, Preacher George. You can go under the water till the frogs know your middle name and it'll never do you any good. Only the blood of Christ is the cleansing agent. Amen. And once we're saved, guess what God wants us to do? He wants us to share our testimony. And Acts 1.18 says, But ye shall receive power. Now, power comes from the Holy Spirit, by the way. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the other parts of the earth. Now, here's the thing. Once you tell someone what Jesus has done for you and you've done, you, you've been the witness he wants you to do, that's all you're required to do. Whether they accept it or not is up to them. But you have cleared yourself. Well, over there he talks about a watchman on the wall over in the book of Ezekiel. And, you know, if you, don't, you see the enemy coming and you don't blow the trumpet and then hit their blood's on your hand. But if you blow the trumpet and they ignore the trumpet, then the blood's on their hand. All your responsibility to do is to do is to just be the witness, whether they accept that message or not. But I'm going to tell you something, if I may, and I hope you think I'm not being oh, I'm not being judgmental. But I happen to believe that the best ter testimony of any Christian is a quiet and gentle life. So I want you to think about that. Okay? Just being quiet, being good to all people. And when you get an opportunity, tell them about Christ. Amen. Well, we cut up early because we got an early start. So you all can go home and get that nap. <laughs> so we'll have a song and look to the Lord and be dismissed. Now, there'll be an evening program starting at 7 o'clock. So, Lord willing, I'll be back up here. I'm dressed in black today because I'm going to be doing a wedding. Probably the saddest thing I do. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding, folks. Just, just kidding. Okay. What page? <clears throat> Number 207. 207?